Welcome to Love Your Family again and again and again and again, the podcast where we focus on parenting with love and clarity. I'm Dr. Marcy, a family culture expert who for over 20 years has been helping parents to create happy and strong families. Today, I am delighted to welcome Raven to the show. Hey, Raven. Hi, Marcy. Thank you for having me here. I am delighted. So I know you have a beautiful five-year-old girl. Tell us about your family. Yes. So Artie is my oldest, Artemis Art for short. Um, So she's my oldest. She's five. And then we do have um, another daughter. Uh, She is 18 months and she is also a force. Um, And so um, it is me and my husband raising two girls. So he is outnumbered, um, which doesn't always benefit me at all because they're daddy's girls. So mommy's second in the house. So it's an interesting dynamic. Um, I didn't think I was going to be a girl mom. So it's been interesting um, being a tomboy and having to, well, Artemis is very girly. Um, The traditional girly girl, like everything you could possibly imagine from glitter to stickers to wanting to be a princess every year for Halloween. So it's been so is your house covered with tiaras then? Tiaras, um, scales, tool, tutus, cowboy boots, you name it, princess shoes, book bags with wings on it, unicorn everything. It's unicorn palooza in here 24-7. <laughs> I love that. So since you are a self-proclaimed tomboy. Is there a piece of the girly girl that you're falling in love with through your daughter that you never knew you loved? Yes, I have to admit, I do enjoy a good bow in the hair, but I actually fuel her her bow thing. And I make sure now I always stop her before she leaves and suggest a bow to her. And I was like, I actually do like those little things and we do bond over them because I do like to shop. So we like bond over that. So I tried in the very beginning, like I tried to get very neutral colors, like here's a white shirt, here's a black shirt, here's a gray shirt. And slowly as she started talking, it was like, oh, there's a pink shirt. Oh, there's a dark pink shirt. Oh, there's a light pink shirt. So I compromise. We meet in the middle at close. She selects the color she wants and we take it from there. <laughs> so she gets to decide the color, you decide the item. So whether it's a t-shirt or shorts or a dress, you're picking not the always. thing. Not always. I get my days. I choose my battles. Oh, I love a good choose your battle because the truth is you gotta, because otherwise there wouldn't be enough goodness in the day. And we want our kids' voices to be heard. So what are some of the battles that you choose but maybe you want to have a little more ease and grace with that we can chat about here. So in terms of, in terms of like, she has this thing with perfectionism. And so that is my battle as a person. I battle with perfectionism. I am a self-proclaimed perfectionist. And so I'm seeing that the behavior in her and I'm noticing, you know, going through adulthood and like oh these things you know you drop this and you pick up that and you learn and you grow and so like I'm freaking out that you know this is a constant battle that we have it's like I thought the only battle we were going to have is just arguing because she has such a strong voice and you know I'm trying to give her her wiggle room to figure out what her voice is going to be while also trying to steer her in the right direction (laughs) So um, I thought that would be our only battle. But now with this like whole idea of having everything needing to be perfect, like it's pink, yes, but it has to be the right shade of pink in this particular moment. So it's like, we'll go through, um, if we're listening to things or we're watching things or she sees something she likes and it's like just slightly off or they don't have her size or something, it's like, oh my God, like I I don't have it. You know, it's, I can't do it. It's not fair. And it's just, that is what I would really love help with and trying to keep her from this idea. I don't even know where it came from, which is like one of the most bizarre things. It's like, cause we don't, we don't mention it. It's not something that we, that it's not, especially something I try not to talk about. Like I don't throw that P word out at all. (laughs) And it's just so interesting that it's just manifesting. And it's like, getting to the point for me where it's starting to like freak me out. Like, what do I do? 
the first thing that I want to highlight that you said, which I loved was that you thought the arguing was going to be the biggest thing because your daughter has a strong voice. So I might encourage just a shift of words slightly of rather than it being arguing, being debating, because we have, right. We have this negative connotation about arguing, but if she has a strong voice and big opinions, then she should be debating things. It's thought provoking. It's enjoyable. It's super fun. It's how we learn about what we think when we're challenged. And so creating a time in your house when it's okay, let's debate this will allow you to be prepared because it's not like I'm trying to pack your lunch and you want to have a big conversation. I can't think that hard while I'm making your turkey sandwich, right? So if you're like, we're going to have a debate about that at dinner, it then allows you you to be excited because I'm sure that you like thinking and have a big voice if your daughter does. It allows it to happen in a time and a context that you can all enjoy it and be taught as a skill rather than, oh, here we go again, right? So- just, you know, a tidbit before we get into the P word, perfectionism. I didn't even think about it that way. I know yeah. she would do that too. She, See? She's, this, and is she's why, a, this is why we debate so that we can learn things. Exactly. She's a big fan of sticking a pin in things and like coming back to it later. So <laughs> she'll love that. <laughs> I, I... I love that she has already learned that phrase and is like, we're going to put a pin in that and come back to it. Does she, is she okay when you put a pin in it to come back to it? Yeah. She'll like roll her eyes and shrug and like stomp off. And then that'll be the end of our conversation, but she'll remind me later. Yeah. So then I have a nuance for that for you of when you say, let's put a pin in it, tell her when you're going to take the pin back out. We're going to put a pin on it in it till bath time. We'll talk about it while I'm washing your hair. We're going to put a pin in it till dinner time. We're going to put a pin in it till this weekend. And Saturday, when we're headed to the park, we'll talk about it then. Like tell her when, because otherwise she doesn't believe you're actually just putting a pin in it. She thinks that you are stopping the conversation dead in its tracks to never be revisited until she reminds you. Okay. It seems like maybe I'm like building out this little angsty teen in this four-year-old body. So thank you. (laughs) I think that you're doing what many, many busy parents do. You're like, yes, we can only have so many conversations at one time. I can only multitask so many things. So we'll talk about that later. And we forget later. Yeah. But so if you say, we'll talk about it later, just decide when it is. And you're more likely to remember it as well. Or be like, hey, we're not talking about that because it's okay to say no and just like end the conversation. We just have to be honest about the fact that then we're ending the conversation. No, actually, we're not going to talk about why the sky is blue anymore. Like I gave you all my thoughts on it. We're done. And it's okay to do that. I always feel like. To me anyway, that's a boundary. I've given you all that I can give. I don't have any, anything else. So I'm done with this. and. There are so many places in our life where that is a useful skill, whether it's with friendships who, with a friend who wants to stay out till midnight and you're like, at 10 PM, I have to go home. Like that's, that's my curfew. Or if we think about a job with a boss who wants more and more and more and more and more of us for us to say, I'm one person, this is what I can give you in romantic relationships, being a healthy partner with someone is where you say, I will give you so much of me, but I'm going to keep this for me. You modeling this for your daughter teaches her about boundaries. And by you saying, this is as much of this conversation as I can get. And now I'm overwhelmed or I'm tired or I'm bored, or I just don't want to talk about it anymore. Teaches her that to respect your boundaries first and foremost, but also that she gets to say, I've had enough. And that's a powerful thing, especially for a little girl with a really strong voice. This is where I stand. This is where I end and you begin. And we don't have to go all the way all the time for all the things. Boundaries are great. I think that's great. I know I like for me, because, you know, you always hear things like, don't say this, don't say can't, don't say no, because you're like slowly building things you're not realizing. And so there's always that fear like, oh, I can't, I can't say no, but so many times a week because then she's going to like, you know think that that's always going to be the case and it's going to like you know keep her small like I want her to continue on with this like trajectory of having this big voice 
um, yeah. whether or not I'm prepared for it at all points in time. <laughs> Well, and that, right, that's so true though, whether or not you're prepared for it for all points in time, she can be as big as she's going to be. That's what you want for her. She also has to go to school and stop talking so the teacher can talk. She also has to go to school and share with her peers because it's not her materials in her bedroom. It's the classroom materials. And so no is an important word to learn because it's part of boundaries. And it's always interesting to me that when, when we're in the parenting world, there's this whole idea that we shouldn't say no to our kids. But if you look at the dating world and the world of sexual consent, which I know we're not supposed to talk about when we talk about kids, but it is connected when it comes to consent, there's a lot of conversations around no being important. And if you know where your no is, you also know where your yes is so that you aren't just like taking whoever's willing to be with you type of conversation. The same yeah. kids are going to grow up and have relationships. So we, we need her to understand that we are going to sometimes say no, as in when she's an adult, people will sometimes say no to her and that's okay. And she can be resilient and strong in the face of that. And sometimes she's going to say, no, no, I don't want to do that. No, I don't want to spend time with you. Not because I don't like you, not because I think you're a bad person, but because right now I need me time. How, what a beautiful gift to teach our kids. And I've seen lots of different ways that we can squash our kids without ever using the, no, the words no or can't or don't. And it's more about that perspective of how do we honor who they are? How do we let them flourish while also teaching them boundaries and to listen to rules and the structure that is required for them to get through school and to live in community because your home, the four of you are a beautiful little community. She has to respect the other people that are part of it. It's a good way to look at it. We're all learning here. We're yeah. like five years, five years in. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. And hopefully that learning never stops because that's what makes amazing people. Yeah. I think like so far, like zero to five, it's been a wonderful journey, like just learning who she is. And so like being able to get to this place and, you know, speak with you about helping to help her reach her potential and all of that good stuff while also making sure I'm doing something right. Yeah. I am certain that you are doing a lot right because any parent who is willing to come and talk to me about what they're doing wrong is already doing a great job as a parent because you're looking at what you're doing. You're considering like, how did that go? And what can I do better next time? And how can I make sure that my daughter becomes an amazing adult. So as long as you're thinking and, and learning and growing, you're doing a great job. Let's talk about that P word, because I didn't say you're being a perfect parent. I said, you're being a great parent. And so what I wonder is, can you talk me through a moment when your daughter had one of these perfectionist moments where something didn't go exactly as planned and it felt really hard? She's writing now. It hasn't been long. School started in September. And so I, at this point, and the one time that points out, sticks out to me, is her second writing assignment of the school year. The teacher, you know, had her write, has to write, she has to write her heading and, you know, the ruled notebooks. It, it was a standard college rule trying to get a five year old to put all their letters inside the lines is extremely difficult. <laughs> and so like trying to explain to her, you know, the difference between when she looks at something that's printed or when we, I write something, it's like, oh, everything is, you know, neat and everything's straight and it goes across the line. And she looks at her paper and she's just like, well, my R is here and the, the M is there. And how come it doesn't fit in between? Like, how can I get it to fit in there? And so like doing the homework, like, you know, having, she did it the first time and it's like, okay, it's not perfect. And so like, you know, she erased it and the paper ripped. And so now we have to get a whole new paper. And so like, she tried again to write her name across the line and it just ended up going across the page diagonally. And she was so frustrated and, you know, I got frustrated. So I like, was like, I need to step away for a moment. I'll be back. So like, I, you know, I stepped into the kitchen and, you know, just stood 
in a spot where she couldn't see me but I just heard her like the frustration like the groaning and the growling and the constant erasing and the writing and it's just like that moment was just like to me I've lived that moment as an adult many times like that wanting to be perfect and making sure that I don't stand out too much and you know everything blends in and so like seeing that in her it's like even though I've told her like this is your second writing assignment you didn't even know what writing was like a year ago you know this is all new and she's like it doesn't matter if it's new I'm in school now there's somebody in class who can write and this is what mine looks like and so you know after I took that moment I went back to her still trying to you know get her to finally just stop and be okay with what it is that she put on the page was so difficult and the crying started it's like oh hers or yours I mean, I was crying the entire time on the inside, but I somebody had to be strong. Um, and so, yeah, <laughs> it was. And then also it gets frustrating to me because the tears come out. And it's just like, well, this is not really, you know, I've seen things like things that you actually cry over. And so trying to have that empathy for this little person whose biggest concern at the moment is that their R doesn't fit between two blue lines. It's like, that's life. Nothing fits between the lines. And so trying to explain that to a five-year-old who is like, unicorns are real. You know, how, how can I explain this to her? Yeah. Yeah. So I can completely picture this scene and every moment of it. So thank you for the description. And I'm sure it's just one of many that happens in your house. I love that you when you hit your threshold that you walked out of the room, Mm -hmm. that you told her you needed a break, walked out of the room and then breathed. Like you modeled self-care without her necessarily seeing it. And another time you might take her with you. I think we both need a break. Let's go stand in the kitchen, take five deep breaths and come back so that she can get that break just like you do. Now, when it comes to perfectionism, there are things to do in the moment that are really powerful. And then things to do on a day-to-day basis across time in your family. So let's start with what you do in the moment. So you did a beautiful job of saying, you're in school, you're learning this. It's part of the process. And setting that expectation that mistakes are part of learning is so powerful that the expectation isn't that this is exactly neat and in between the lines. The expectation is that you're trying. So let's do it once, or I might give her a number. Like, let's do it. You get three tries because if you take all of the tries away from a perfectionist and are like, we're just going to do it once and it's fine, move on. You know, she's going to fight back against that. So, but tell her, look, when we sit down for homework, at most you get three tries. So we're going to take the best out of three. Which one do you, ready? Let's go. So that she can practice, but she doesn't have to get it exactly right right? So limiting that so that she can keep going on because writing her name was not the whole, the end of the homework. She had to then do the rest of the homework. So you want to keep her moving by giving her a certain number. Keep revisiting that conversation of mistakes are part of learning. And when she says, yeah, but there's another kid in the class that can do it and I get it. Yeah. But I bet there's something that you can do that that kid can't. The idea of strengths and weaknesses overall is part of that ongoing conversation that we're going to talk about in a minute. The other piece in the minute, in the, in the moment is to when she does write her name, even if it's slanted upward and not in between the line, celebrate her, celebrate the fact that she attempted. Now I want to be clear that I'm not a like celebrate everything your kid does every moment that they do it, because that's sometimes a lot too much, but I am a fan of celebrating effort. And when our kids are learning something new, when they are growing and expanding, having someone be a cheerleader for the attempt, not for the perfection, it's really important because she'll hear your voice in her head. And so if you're sitting there going, well, do you want to try again? She's going to go, oh, it wasn't good. I should try again. If you go, wow, you did, you did that so well. What do you think about that? She's going to hear your voice first because you're going to prime that this looks great and it makes it more likely that she'll do it and keep moving on and not try again and again. 
if we're enthusiastic. Does that all okay. make sense? It does. It does. It's just finding that balancing act. Cause it's like, she doesn't give me feedback because she's five. So I'm just like, you know, saying these things and I'm just like thinking that they're either going over her head or she's not listening to me at all. Cause she's thinking about unicorns and glitter or just a number of other things. So it's just like, and then I'm getting frustrated because I keep saying the same things and I don't know if it's sticking. So I'll keep at that, even yeah. though I'm not getting that feedback. <laughs> well, and you're not getting the immediate feedback, but you're getting long-term feedback. Our kids are always listening, whether we think they are or not, whether they're thinking consciously or not, it's going into their brain in the unconscious part of their brain. So if we are cheerleading them and going, wow, you're working really hard. I love how much effort you're putting into this. Keep going. Some part of her brain is going to get that message of, oh, when I, when I'm working hard, I keep going. I don't have to erase and do it again. Oh, mom's really proud of me. Okay. I'm going to, I I did it. I like finishing, getting to the end of the page and doing the dance party. That's awesome. So it's going in somewhere, even if you're not getting the immediate feedback. And so trust the process. As in, even though she's not being like, thanks mom for encouraging me, or yeah, I did do a good job. Know that that's because she's a kid and she doesn't have to respond the way we have already learned to respond in a conversation. So those are, those are rules that she is learning, but it's going in. And that's part of who you are as mom is helping her think better when she's doing these things. You know, the perfectionist thoughts that are in your head help combat those that are in her head. So if you were sitting there going, it's not perfect, it's not perfect. You go, okay, well, what would I want to hear? I want to hear, that's great. Keep going. That's good enough. You're learning, right? Whatever it is that you'd want to hear, share to her because she is your daughter. So give her those words. Okay, now, long-term, ongoing, how do we change this as a habit? There are a few things. One is this idea of talking about strengths and weaknesses. We all have strengths and weaknesses, but when you're a perfectionist, you only want to have strengths. You don't want to have any weaknesses. But when we can accept that we are learning things, then we accept that we're not perfect and it's easier. So talking about what she is great at so she can feel that pride, that that accomplishment, and also what is she learning? Compare that to yourself because then she'll hear that you are not perfect either, which is helpful for her and probably for you, right? And have it, that can be like a family dinner conversation. And that kid in her class who can write their name perfectly, well, what are they still learning? And I always talk about weaknesses as things that we're learning, not weaknesses, because we can learn anything. So that's one piece. The second piece is to talk about excellence over perfection. Because we can never reach perfection. There's no, you know, the store doesn't have your size dress. I didn't write the word perfectly. These are things that will happen and are okay and are part of life. And I can still be hardworking and wonderful and amazing and excellent. So if she strives for excellence, that talks about the effort she puts forward, not the end result and the accomplishment. Okay. Yep. And one more piece is talking to her about doing hard things. One of my favorite lines, and I actually have a piece of art in my house that says we can do hard things, is to have that be a line that is said in your house on a daily basis. We can do hard things because that's everything from, can I put on my shoe when it gets stuck to can I pour my own milk when I'm big enough to can I learn this new skill in school or can I share with my sister when she gets big enough to take my toys, right? All of those pieces, if I've learned as a person that I can do hard things, then I'm willing to go through those hard moments of learning, which combats perfectionism. How's that sound? How much do you talk about doing hard things? We, we do and then we don't. I feel like when it comes to like doing anything that's hard, we're more so of like, a showy family like we we just get it done it's just like I'll, we gripe about like the us adults well my husband and I will gripe about things and you know gripe about them in front of her but we'll also show her that we're doing it like we don't like that we're doing this but we're doing it 
Um, and I'm trying to have those conversations with her so she understands that there is this thing that is, you know, there is this thing that's hard. Then there are things that are easy and it's it'll be interchangeable. We can't always expect it things to go one way or the other. Um, and she's very narrow focused on things and is always positive about things. So that moment of an obstacle comes in her way or she trips and she falls, like it's the end of the world and we have to just hit reboot on everything because yeah. this now changes her entire persona, her entire person. And because she doesn't have that as a piece of, of how she sees herself. So you need to start talking to her about her being a kid who is resilient. She's a person who can problem solve. And so I would start naming those attributes about her that you can hit a problem and figure it out, solve it and keep going. You're amazing. Even though that's not what you're seeing yet, but she doesn't have that identity. So when she does trip and fall, she's like, but I'm not a person who falls. This is wrong. The world is wrong. And like, it becomes this big response because it doesn't match up with who she thinks herself to be. But if she thinks of herself as I'm someone who can trip and fall and get back up and keep going. Well, then when she trips and falls, she can get back up and keep going. So start naming that, right? We don't often talk to our kids about who they are becoming. And sometimes we use words about who they are that don't build the identity we want. And so I don't expect that you're the person who is like, ah, oh, stop crying. It's just a trip. It's not a big deal. Get over it. I don't think that's you, but sometimes parents talk that way that doesn't help them realize that they can do this. But when she trips and falls and being like, hey, you can get up. Like, I know that you are capable of doing this. Come on, you're strong. Stand up, let's go. And you being cool in that moment, right? Cool, calm, and collected will help her be it. The other piece is that modeling that you talked about, which is so beautiful of sharing those moments that you're doing something hard. I would also share mistakes. We usually don't talk about them because we don't think about it. Like, did you start writing a proposal for something at work and realize you did it completely wrong? You had to delete the entire thing or a giant section of it and start again. We don't tell our kids those stories because why? why? But when you're navigating perfectionism, you need to start telling those stories so they can hear it. Over the dinner time, oh my gosh, I did this thing. I, I went to buy lunch and I left my wallet at home so I got all the way to the counter at the deli and had to look at the guy and humbly ask him to hold my sandwich while I went back to the office and got my credit card. And like, oh my gosh, I felt like, I felt so silly and it was really hard. But the guy at the counter was really nice about it. And I don't think he'll ever remember. That was just a silly story in my head. Like I have to be okay with making mistakes. If those are the kind of stories you tell at dinner, this idea of perfectionism will melt away from her because she'll start to see, oh, it's not, it's not a problem to have problems. You just have to come up with the solution and keep going because we can figure out everything. Yeah, uh, that's a good, that's a good takeaway. Um, yeah, it's just personally, it's hard to admit those, <laughs> those mm -hmm. moments. <laughs> Yep. Uh, I'm I'm still a work in progress. And that which yeah. is something which is something recently that I've actually like said out loud to Art and it was like scary at first. I'm like, like we had an argument or something, and she's like, Well, why didn't you do this? And I'm like, Because I'm a person and I get things wrong too. And I was like, like, yes, I'm not perfect. Like I can't make everything happen at the same time. And so like having that frustration, and she just looked at me. And I was like, I felt good to say to her. And it's also that thing, like how, like at what level am I supposed to talk to her, like talk to her about things like, you know, my frustrations, like how much of me and my frustrations am I supposed to show her? So <laughs> it's like, yes, this is who I am. It's just like, oh, you are a person. And there are moments that also come to light where she'll like, instead of calling me mommy, she'll call me by my first name. It's like, oh, so she does know that I'm a person. And so she, I'm starting to see that she's realizing that too. Um, so I think if I'm able to show her the mom side and then, oh, this is also me, Raven, that at some point 
um she'll she'll we'll be doing something right and she'll get it she'll understand <laughs> yeah i love that and the you giving yourself permission to be a human a whole human with all of the things that come with that gives her permission to be a human and all of the things that come with it so we don't want to be a hot mess that our kids need to take care of and put back together but we do want to show them how we have our feelings, how we problem solve, how we think through things and the process to get to the other side of it. So show her your frustration, not at her, but that you're frustrated in, in an experience because it happens and how you move through that. So she learns those tools also. But one of the biggest things you just said was that you're learning too. And we can't ask our kids to do things that we're not willing to do first. So if you want her to be a person in the world who accepts challenges and problem solving and excellence over perfection, then you have to be that person too and do the work to get there. Getting there. Getting there, <laughs> she's yes. She's definitely like been the motivation and, you know, she's older now. So we have like these, we have our deep philosophical five-year-old talks and it's like, oh my gosh, this is great. And so it, I, it's getting easier to like instill certain things and show her a little more about like the world and growing up and, you know, the P word. It's just like, it's okay. So I was like, it's been, it's been fun so far figuring these things out. I love that. All right. So on that note, we're going to wrap up. If there was one suggestion that you're going to put in place today, tonight with your family, what would it be? Ooh, that's difficult because there's everything needs to be one in place. Um, honestly, it's just, it's making sure that I, I name what it is that, you know, I'm doing or how I'm feeling. Cause I get so wrapped up in, you know, every day that I forget that she's learning and, you know, she's not going to know the definition of something, or she's not going to know what this emotion is in the moment. And if I don't, if I don't call it out, so that, which also requires me to be more present in certain moments to be able to call out what it is that she's feeling so that she knows. Um, so yeah, I don't always think about it because sometimes I'm like, she clearly sees that I'm scowling. So she has to understand that I'm angry as opposed to me being like, mommy's upset right now. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I love that. That is a fabulous, fabulous takeaway. And I've learned that, you know, when we, when we highlight the one thing and we start taking small steps, we're more likely to actually make change than when we're like, I'm going to do everything. Cause then we get overwhelmed and we do nothing, which is why I love the, the one thing you'll, you'll do. So thank you Raven for sharing about your family, sharing about your experience as a mom and being really transparent about who you are in the world. It's been such a joy. Thank you so much for this opportunity and getting to talk about my little glitter monster. <laughs> love a good glitter monster. <laughs> All right. And thank you for listening. I know your time is precious and limited. Grateful that you shared it with me and Raven. Curious listener, what is your one action step? Share it with me in the comments on my website at drmarcy.com. And if you want to be the first to know when new episodes come out, go to drmarcy.com backslash podcast, sign up for my mailing list. Want to be a guest on a future episode of love, my, love Your Family again and again and again and again? Go to drmarcy.com backslash podcast guests and let me know. And finally, do you need individualized help with your family? Do you want to have a private session with me or someone from my team virtually or in your home? Then visit drmarcy.com backslash contact and reach out. Remember, blue skies are ahead and we're going to get there together.